I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me today to talk about our project and our paper, which is called Differential Abilities to Engage Inaccessible Chromatin, Diversify Vertebrate Hox Binding Patterns. Hox genes pattern tissues in all bilaterian animals along the main axis. And in vertebrates, one of the tissues that is patterned by Hox genes is the spinal cord and the fates of motor neurons and interneurons along the rostrocaudal axis. So for example, at forelimb and hind limb levels, limb innervating fate is controlled by Hox paralog 6 and 10. However, what we still don't fully understand is how do these proteins, which are so similar, perform such vastly different functions during animal development. And the question that we're trying to address is how do these proteins, which have highly similar DNA binding domains, bind in the genome, activate target gene expression, and control cell fates? To address this question, requires homogeneous relevant cell populations at scales compatible with chromatin immunoprecipitation. So for that reason, we turn to an in vitro differentiation strategy, which, which recapitulates key aspects of development. By treating mouse embryonic stem cells with patterning signals, retinoic acid and sun hedgehog, these cells differentiate into motor neurons by transitioning through all of the relevant progenitor stages thereby recapitulating not only the cell fate, but actually the timing of these key developmental processes. And importantly, what this strategy allows us to have not only a homogeneous relevant population of cells, but also in this time series manner, where we also had access to progenitors that would be difficult to isolate. In addition to that, we generated inducible transgenic Hox lines where we can overexpress a single Hox protein but under the same cellular and chromatin landscapes. And importantly, we knew that these cell lines recapitulate some of the known in vivo phenotypes. So for example, the inducible HOXY6 and 8 lines induce markers of liminar fate, as would be expected, and the inducible thoracic HOXY9 line represses a slew of anterior HOX genes, as it does in vivo. So we first began by asking globally what happens at the transcriptional level in these inducible Hox lines. So we compared the RNA-seq data sets generated in the inducible Hox lines. And as you can see, they induce distinct transcriptional profiles, which are different compared to control cells, suggesting that they're actually patterning cell fates during this differentiation. So we then asked, do Hox transcription factors induce these distinct transcriptomes by binding to the same sites in the genome? or do they bind different sites? And in these heat maps here, every row is a single binding event, and they're centered around the midpoints of the CHIPS-T peaks. So essentially where you see more color, there is more protein binding in the genome. And what this analysis revealed is that the, while there is a group of sites that is shared by the analyzed Hox transcription factors, there are also groups of sites that are uniquely bound by one or two Hox proteins. And what stood out in particular was this large group of sites bound uniquely by the central Hox, Hoxy6, and a large group of sites bound uniquely by the posterior Hoxy9 protein. So we wanted to understand what explains these different genomic binding profiles. So to address that, we turn to two important factors in transcription factor binding in the genome, and that is sequence preference and prior accessibility. And in terms of sequence preference, we knew from previously published in vitro binding data sets that the vertebrate hoxes 1 through 8 prefer this TA18 motif, while the posterior proteins 9 through 13 prefer this TT18 motif. And we utilize three different bioinformatical approaches to address sequence preference, but I will tell you about one of them today. And that is a motif scanning approach to directly compare the overrepresentation of these two types of motifs at the different groups of sites that you have already seen. So what this analysis revealed is that we can explain a set of the binding differences by sequence preference. And in particular, what we can explain is why there is a large group of sites bound uniquely by the central HOXY6, because we see a much higher overrepresentation of that 
type of motif at that set of sites. However, what we cannot explain by any of the sequence preference analysis that we have utilized is why there is a large group of sites bound uniquely by HOXI9 versus a smaller set of sites that is bound both by HOXI9 and the other posterior protein, which is HOXI10. So to further, further explore what could be behind these binding differences, we decided to investigate the prior accessibility at the Hox binding sites. And to do that, we performed a tax seek at this progenitor stage, which is prior to the time point where we treat the cells with the signal that induces Hox overexpression, essentially asking what is the accessibility landscape like before the Hox proteins are present. And we were curious if we would see evidence for differential abilities to engage with inaccessible chromatin. So first, we globally looked at the accessibility landscape of the sites bound by the Hox transcription factors. And we saw a difference not only in the overall distribution of a taxi creeds, but the median being shifted towards less accessible sites, particularly in the protein HOXC9. And if you remember, that is the protein that had a unique set of sites that was bound just by that protein, which we could not explain by sequence preference. So we extended this analysis to look at the accessibility at the different groups of Hox binding sites. And when we performed that analysis, we saw that there is a much higher accessibility landscape at the shared sites versus sites bound just by HOXI6 compared to other other groups of sites. And what stood out was that large group of sites bound uniquely by HOXI9, which has a very low prior accessibility. So we were then curious to see, does HOX transcription factor binding change the accessibility? So we performed a taxi after HOX overexpression in the different cell lines. And we saw that after HOX binding, there is an increase in local chromatin accessibility. But what again stood out was that large group of sites found uniquely by HOXI9 in a low prior accessibility, which has a big increase in the accessibility landscape after HOXI9 is bound there, suggesting that not only can HOXI9 engage in sites that are not accessible, but it can change and increase the accessibility after it is bound. So, so far, we have shown you that out the two different posterior proteins that we have investigated, we saw differences in their abilities to engage with chromatin. And we were essentially curious to see which one out of those two proteins is the outlier compared to other posterior proteins. So we extended this analysis first to other Hox9 paralogs, and then to the most posterior Hox, which is Hox C13. So first, when we investigated, the binding and prior accessibility of the two HOX9 paralogs that we looked at, which is HOX A9 and B9, we realized that they do not share the same preference for variant accessible chromatin as HOX C9 does. And when we compared their genomic binding profiles, we again discovered a set of sites bound uniquely by HOX C9 that was in very inaccessible chromatin. So this suggests that this ability to engage with inaccessible sites can even sometimes separate within the same paralog group. And when we compared the binding and accessibility of HOXI13, we saw that it had a very high ability to engage with inaccessible sites, even greater than HOXI9. And this is in line with two recently published papers showing that HOX13 paralogs increase accessibility at specific sites during limb and genital development. So overall, this analysis shows that the posterior group of Hox transcription factors displays a range of abilities to engage with inaccessible sites. And the last part of the story that I will tell you about today involves trying to understand which part of the Hox protein is responsible for engaging with inaccessible chromatin. So to address that, we made chimeric Hox proteins by swapping the N terminus and the homeodomain and C terminus of two Hox proteins, and that is Hox C13 and 10, which had very high versus low abilities to engage with inaccessible chromatin. 
And we also took into account a conserved region located upstream of the Homeo domain, thereby making a total of four different chimeric hops. And what we essentially tried to address with this approach is, is this ability to engage with inaccessible sites driven by a cofactor interaction through the N-terminus, or is it that the Homeo domain not only controls sequence, but also this ability? And we first compared the genomic binding of the Hox chimeras with Hox C10 and 13. And when we did that, we realized that the chimeras share a more similar binding profile to the Hox protein, which has the same TNA binding domain and C terminus. But importantly, you will see that the chimeras are distinct from both Hox C10 and Hox C13 suggesting that overall genomic binding is controlled by all three parts of the protein. So the N-terminus and the DNA binding domain and the C-terminus. And we finally asked, what is the prior accessibility landscape like at the sites bound by the chimeric costs? And we realized that the chimeras with the DNA binding domain and C-terminus of Hox C13 we're binding to very inaccessible sites, suggesting that these two parts of the protein, the DNA binding domain and the C-terminus are sufficient for binding inaccessible sites. And we speculate that this could extend to other transcription factors that also contain homeodomains. So overall, during the course of our study, we investigated seven different Hox proteins. And out of the two central proteins that we investigated, Hox C6 and 8, we noticed that they had similar sequence preference and accessibility preference, and they also had very similar genomic binding. But out of the posterior Hox proteins that we looked at, we saw differences in their abilities to engage with inaccessible chromatin. So for example, out of these four proteins here, while they have the same sequence preference, where Hoxy9 distinguishes itself from the rest is by having a higher ability to engage with inaccessible sites. And where Hox C13 is the most different out of all of the analyzed Hox proteins is because it not only has a slight sequence preference difference, but also a very high ability to engage with inaccessible sites. So our current model is that we think that when, that when thinking about Hox binding specificity, it's important to take into account not only cofactor interactions and sequence preference, but also this intrinsic ability to engage with inaccessible sites that might be different between the analyzed Hox proteins. So for example, out of the ones we investigated, these two stood out by having a higher ability to do that. And with that, I would like to thank my whole lab and especially my advisor, Esfan Lazoni, for his feedback, support, and help my thesis committee and our collaborators at Penn State, NYU, and Columbia, but in particular, Sean Mahoney and Divyanshi Srivastava, whose expertise has been crucial in making this collaborative project what it is. And I would also like to thank our funding sources and also the organizers for inviting me today. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, that was excellent. So while I wait for Melissa to join me on stage, can I uh, just remind you that all of the talks will be available on the Node shortly. So if you miss the end of the talk or you just want to see it again, go to the Node um, in, uh, shortly and you'll be able to uh, see the talk again. And also just a tip, if you're having problems with the software, the first thing to do is just try refreshing your browser. So thanks, Melissa, that was a great talk. You've already got a whole list of questions. So let me start off with the top one. So do the different posterior hoxes have distinct cofactors that might explain chromatin binding preferences? Yeah, that's a great question. We attempted to address that by looking at the binding patterns of both MIS and PBX cofactors. And our results suggest that they do not specify distinct sets of binding sites, but they in fact seem to kind of follow the binding pattern of the Hox protein itself. Uh, and also our analysis with the chimeric Hox would suggest that it's an intrinsic um, ability that would be driven by the DNA binding domain and C-terminus. Mm -hmm. 
So that sort of also follows on to the next question there. So are Hox proteins pioneers? Yes, we, th we think that um, they could be classified as pioneers. Uh, some researchers would probably expect to follow up with showing that they do really engage with nucleosomes and evict them. Um, so we, that's why we're lar largely referring to this as an ability to engage with inaccessible chromatins, and they might in fact be pioneers. Um, then Jeremy Green is asking, do you have any insight into how much Hox protein levels affect their abundance at inaccessible chromatin sites? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. We did not compare protein levels. We compared it RNA levels in our inducible Hox lines. We see very similar levels of expression and they are isogenic lines. So they're in the exact same construct in a single copy in the genome. But it, it would be very interesting to compare by Western blot the protein levels, I agree. Yeah. And um, just one more question, um, uh, because we're running out of time, but I just remind everyone that if you want, if you have questions or want to follow up on any of these answers, then Melissa will be available uh, after the talks finish. So as a last question from Jeremy Dason, is there a biological purpose to having C9 and C13 having these special functions? Yeah, that, that's a phenomenal question. And it really, we do see a really interesting correlation with some of the known in vivo phenotypes. So Hox C9 in particular stands out compared to all other nine paralogs in having this ability to globally repress a slew of other anterior Hox transcription factors and essentially carve out the thoracic region of the spinal cord. Um, and we also know that Hox C13 paralogs have important um, functions in axial elongation for ter or termination of growth in axial elongation. So we, yeah, I agree that it's a very interesting correlation with biologically uh, interesting functions. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. I uh, look forward Thank to you seeing much. you later.